However, what we see with the, with the White House's executive order on AI that came out, we see point blank in multiple points within it, statements about the need for a federal privacy law to deal with AI and the ramifications thereof. But with the concept of AI and healthcare and health data as both revolutionary and risky. And I think that we should start with revolutionary because there's no doubt that what AI is ushering in is immeasurable opportunity. Oh, absolutely. And I've said it before that this is what I call objective use of AI. If you have AI reading CT scans over millions and millions of individuals to be able to identify specific attributes of certain things they're looking for, like tumors or cysts or whatever, and identify, that's something a human could never do in their lifetime. They could never compile and assess that amount of data. Same thing for looking at lab work, uh, different types of blood work, being able to identify early markers or something that might, that a clinician could never do. They could never read enough articles or assess enough lab sheets on millions of patients to be able to identify that, that is a fantastic use of AI to be able to pull that together. And there are countries who allow um, health data to be de-identified and used for statistical and research purposes. Mm -hmm. And then there are countries that don't. And I have to tell you, there are people in these situations that would absolutely love to submit their information to a statistical or research database so other people could learn from what they've gone through. And sometimes it's almost impossible because of the laws that they're subject to. And I think, you know, when we think also about this has come up in the news a number of different times, or I, I, I should say news very sort of broadly speaking in terms of articles and thoughtware that's come out on, on how AI can benefit in a healthcare setting is also on the automation and more importantly, the standardization of language within yes. visit notes, because humans can use, especially in English, there are an unbelievable number of synonyms that can be used to describe the same type of circumstance and same observable characteristics. Even within the medical field where you would think it would be a much more narrow lexicon, it's not. It's huge. It's not. It's so huge. We, it's huge. So if we think about the opportunity to do that there, we can have it empirically with looking at um, radiology and lab results and revolutionizing the way in which clinical research is conducted, as Kay said, this huge data sets, but then also being able to actually get the information that the human has seen and notes that have been taken into the patient's record much more quickly with standardized language so that as there is transfer between doctors, as the individual may need to go on for advanced care, we have, again, a standardized set of language being used. So huge, huge strides that, again, it would take a team of medical coders umpteen million years to go through and do. Um, and I think Absolutely. something else that... that goes and, and should be mentioned is that there's opportunity to use AI to start to close and mitigate some of the risks in healthcare cybersecurity right now. Yes. I don't think a day goes by where there are not multiple announcements of breaches in hospital centers, doctors' practices, insurers, uh, ancillary vendors too. So the business associates that we were referring to earlier, the healthcare space is absolutely, um, seems to have not put forward cybersecurity investment historically. And now that's starting to come to the forefront in terms of the amount of risk that's out there. So that's right. And part of, part of that being the legacy systems that they're using. Yes. So healthcare, government, education, those are all based on systems that were built decades ago. And they're not really great about updating to new systems and new software. They just want to keep putting patches on old systems and legacy systems and bringing those in. So that's what really makes them right as a target. And Internet of Things, you have one smart toaster in your hospital and a bad actor can get in through that. They're inside the firewall. They can get to the other things. It really is critical. And I will say one of the other things she was talking about, the clinical visit notes and translating is the information blocking law that mm -hmm. is active in the U.S. now where patients have to have access to their records, like log in through a portal and they have to have certain information available to them. The doctors cannot hold those lab results or those imaging results back to give them a chance to talk to the patients. So if that tumor is not benign 
or that lab result shows something that's devastating, they cannot hold that data back from the portal to give them time to talk to the patient. So now you've got this information available to the patient and they don't have the information necessary to understand what it means. Yeah. That can be traumatizing on multiple, multiple levels. So I agree. So let's move on looking at the at the risky parts. FDA, that's always risky. We love the FDA. <laughs> yeah, so software is a medical device, yes. Yeah. So the idea here with the, with certainly with the first bullet point is thinking about, so let's say you're in the space, you're dialed in, you're forward thinking, you've got your privacy program locked down, you've got your cybersecurity ready. Perfect. You're ready for AI, except your vendors might not be ready for you. So for anyone out there who has dialed in because they are an AI technology that is looking to, or is working in the health data space, Again, you are going to be one technology, many masters potentially. Yes. So you have to be dialed in on the FDA, the FTC, and HIPAA. Um, I'm sort of sad we couldn't. Well, get and that's here happen. in the U.S. If, right. if and that just, is in yeah. the U.S. That's not even taking into account all of these similar types of regulatory agencies in the other countries for food and drug, for medical devices, for software okay. regulation, for import and export requirements that you have. Yeah, it's not even taken into account. Think what you have here in the U.S. to work with. And then wham, all of a sudden, now you've got a client that's subject to GDPR. And you might literally be four vendors down from yeah. that ultimate client that makes you subject to GDPR. But those requirements push down to every layer. The so understanding that genealogy, um, the move it vulnerability is a wonderful um, one to take into account that, you might not have used Move It, but you started asking if your vendors use Move It. Well, they don't use Move It, so they started asking their vendors if they use Move It. We're not at the end of the rack yet finding out whether or not 10 vendors down used Move It and did that impact your patient. Yep. And as we talked about, and, and this one we can go, this bullet, it it deserves re-mention because I don't know that the lay person out there, which would by and large be all of us because none of us are super, super technicians here, but the ability to re-identify previously de-identified data cannot be underscored. Yeah. It is ungodly easy to do now. Mm -hmm. um, and as advances in computing continue, yeah. it will become easier and easier. Just Bear in mind that it, it can it can be, so be very cautious about that, particularly as it comes to feeding AI models and using it in this kind of a capacity. Okay, go please. The one thing that stuck out to me is a lot of these laws actually have provisions to where you cannot consider something de-identified unless you actually have policies mm -hmm. and protocols in place that one, state that it's de-identified, two, state you will not acquire information to re-identify, and three, that you will not actively try to re-identify the data. So mm -hmm. you may think you have it de-identified, but you don't have these policies in place. And so under those laws, it's not de-identified anyway. And that's a critical piece to make sure that you understand when it comes to de-identified data that I neglected to mention earlier. I did not not think about it. Jenna Lynn saying it just made me go, oh my gosh, you also have to have this. Yes. Document, yes. document, document. Make sure you understand the laws there. Absolutely. Because, because it is critical and it actually dovetails very nicely when we're talking about this data with yeah. the concept of consent and secondary uses. So we talked about that earlier, but bear in mind that we can't really fully contemplate or conceive of future uses but that's so okay, Jenna Lynn. Not... I'm just going to hold on to the data because in 50 years, there'll be something I can do with it. Exactly. Exactly. So that would be like beyond secondary and tertiary into a word that I can't conjugate uses. But so bear in mind, if your model is based on consent, you don't have consent for something that none of us know about yet. And you right. don't get to just say that because you got consent the first time, you've got it in perpetuity. We've got that addressed through the concept of secondary use. And certainly when it comes to AI and innovation in technology and modeling and algorithms and the rest of it. Let's be honest. The average person has no idea what we do with data now anyway, much less what we could do with data with emerging technology. 